Ladies and gentlemen, as Vice President of the American Mathematical Society, I'd like to welcome you here in Schoenberg Hall and in the overflow locations to the Einstein Public Lecture in Mathematics. Launched in 2005, the 100th anniversary of Einstein's Annus Mirabilis, in which Einstein published his papers on the photoelectric effect, Brownian motion, and special relativity. Here's the list of the Einstein lecturers. Sir Michael Atia, Benoit Mandelbrot, Sir Roger Penrose, Michael Waterman, and today, Professor Turi Tao from here at UCLA. In 2006, Professor Tao won the Fields Medal, generally considered the highest award in mathematics. His single most famous result, joined with Ben Green, is a proof that you can find billions of evenly spaced prime numbers, indeed as many as you like. Tao's website on Google Buzz is, in my opinion, the best site on the internet, with fascinating observations for a wide audience. I go there every day now. <laughs> I go. MacArthur Fellow, Fellow of the Royal Society, Foreign Associate of the United States National Academy of Sciences, and member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, speaking today on the cosmic distance ladder, we will shortly have Terry Tao. After his talk, there will be time for questions, and then you're all invited to a reception. But first, our host and co-sponsor, UCLA Vice Chancellor, James Economo. Well, good evening. I'm uh, very pleased to represent uh, Chancellor Block at the uh, Einstein uh, lecture this evening. I'm, from, I'm on the School of Medicine faculty, and it's, it was a privilege on July 1 to succeed Professor Roberto Pache as uh, Vice Chancellor for Research. I'd like to thank the American Mathematical Society for selecting Professor Terence Tao as tonight's distinguished Einstein lecture. In addition to uh, the Chancellor's Office, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the support of the uh, Division of Physical Sciences, uh, the Office of the Dean, and the Mathematics Department uh, for hosting tonight's event. You may be aware that the Department of Mathematics is one of six departments that comprise the Division of Physical Sciences. The others include physics and astronomy, earth and space sciences, atmospheric and oceanic sciences, statistics, and chemistry and biochemistry. Within, the, within this uh, division, there are also a number of uh, preeminent institutes. The Institute for Geophysics and Planetary Systems, the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics, and the Institute of the Environment. The distinguished faculty from this uh, division include four recipients of the Nobel Prize, six National Medals of Science, and 20 members of the National Academy of Sciences. Professor Tao became the first mathematics professor in UCLA history to be awarded the Fields Medal, often described as the Nobel Prize in mathematics. In the 70 years that this uh, prize has been awarded by the International Mathematical Union, only 48 researchers ever uh, received it. He's also received numerous other national and international honors. Outstanding graduate students from around the world traveled to UCLA to study with uh, Terry. At only 24, he was appointed to full professor. And to this day, he remains the youngest person ever appointed to that rank at this university. In 2007, he became the first incumbent of the James and Carol Collins chair after a generous endowment by Mr. and Mrs. Collins. So I join um, Frank Morgan uh, and the department in um, um, recognizing uh, Terry for his many accolades. And uh, it's a privilege to uh, be able to introduce him. He'll speak this, in, this evening about cosmic, the cosmic distance ladder. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming here. Um, I'm very honored to be uh, giving the Einstein Lecture Series. Um, of course, it's a very distinguished uh, um, list of previous speakers, but of course, Einstein himself is, uh, is uh, such a legend. Uh, he's such a great scientist. He did so many great things. Um, but, um, you know, even someone as great as Einstein didn't work in a vacuum. He, uh, the work that he did was built on the work of many, many people before him. Um, and, um, you know, he was part of a larger scientific story, in fact, part of many, many uh, scientific stories. And what I want to talk about today is just one of them, the cosmic distance ladder. Um, and this is one of my favorite stories, actually, a, st a story about math and physics and uh, astronomy and history. It's a very long story. It's uh, over 2,000 years old, and it's still going. The story has not ended. Um, you would have learned about parts of this story at school, or in uh, textbooks, or on the internet. But it's rare that you see the entire story at once. And this is what I want to convey, that, that science is not just an isolated um, set of facts, but it's really part of a very large narrative. And this is a great example of one. OK, so the cosmic distance ladder is a foundation um, of astrometry. And what is astrometry? Astrometry is a major subfield of astronomy. It is the study of positions and movements of celestial bodies, planets, moons, suns, galaxies. Um, you want to know where they are, where they're going. And the typical questions you ask in astrometry are things like this. Um, how far is it from the Earth to the moon? Or from the Earth to the sun? Or from the sun to Mars? Or from the sun to Alpha Centauri? Or from the sun to Aldebaran? Um, or the Andromeda, Andromeda Galaxy? Questions like this. Now, nowadays, it's, it's quite easy to uh, answer these questions. Uh, you just look it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> um, but how does Wikipedia know? You know, it comes from uh, the astronomers. How do the astronomers know? I mean, th these are not easy distances to measure. Um, they're far too vast to measure them directly. You know, if you want to, to measure the distance of the galaxy over there, you can't just take a ruler or something. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just uh, immense distances that you can't measure directly. But what astro astronomers have done is that they have found many, many ingenious ways to measure distances indirectly. So for example, the distance d1 to that um, galaxy over there, we might not work out directly, or the distance d2 to that galaxy over, the, over there. But we might be able to work out the ratio between um, um, the first distance and the second distance. And we have many ways of measuring ratios of dis dis distances by, comparison, by comparing one um, distance with another one. Um, and th these methods, um, they use a lot of technology and science, but they, often, um, uh, they also just, uh, often just use some basic mathematics, also some, sometimes some very advanced mathematics. Um, in this particular case, uh, one way to measure ratios between distances is to use the Hubble law, which I'll talk about later. Um, the Hubble law connects distances to uh, galaxies with, um, with their velocity, and uh, you can measure velocity by the redshift, and uh, from that and a bit of mathematics, you can work out the ratio between these distances. I'll explain that a bit later. So we have all these indirect methods, and what they do is that they control large distances, distances to very far objects, in terms of slightly less far distances, distances to slightly smaller objects. And these distances, in turn, are controlled by slightly um, smaller distances, and you can go, keep going down and down and down, until finally you can reach a distance that you can actually measure directly. Um, and so you have this hierarchy of distances, you have this hierarchy of ratios, and you put them all together, and you get the cosmic distance ladder. And this is the way that we measure uh, distances um, throughout the universe. So what I'm going to do in this talk is climb this ladder um, from a historical perspective, um, starting at the very base of the ladder, which is distances on the Earth, and then moving up to the moon, and then the sun, and, and the planets, and so forth. Um, and we'll see how each rung was developed and how each one builds on the previous one. This is the story I want to tell. So the first rung is the Earth. Okay? So nowadays we know a lot about the Earth. We know the Earth is round, or well, approximately round. Uh, it's about uh, six, uh, 6,300 uh, kilometers in radius, um, a little bit wider at the equator than at the poles. But we know um, pretty much exactly how, how big it is, and we have extremely accurate maps of it. Um, so then nowadays, this is very easy um, because we have all these satellites and we have all these uh, um, maps and, and, uh, and, um, and we have surveyed every single um, uh, square inch of the planet, really. Um, so we have all this. But just imagine for now 
that we didn't have all this technology. Suppose we did not have satellites, spacecraft, or telescopes. Suppose we didn't have the ability to cross the ocean. We didn't have airplanes. We didn't even have telescopes um, or sextants. Um, no technology at all. Is it still possible with no technology uh, to calculate the radius of the Earth, these numbers I just, I just gave you? Actually, even more basic question, can you even tell the Earth is round? And the amazing thing is that the answer is yes. Um, all you need is, is uh, just some geometry. And you can already work out that the Earth is round and, you, and what its radius is. And this was done over 2,000 years ago by the ancient Greeks. So, um, for example, uh, the first person to convincingly argue that the Earth was round was Aristotle over 23 centuries ago. And so he gave an indirect argument. All the arguments I will give are indirect. Indirect argument that the Earth is round. And like all indirect arguments, you don't just look at the object that you're trying to study. Uh, I mean, if you look at the Earth, you can't really tell that it's round or flat. But you have to use an indirect um, observation using a second object, in this case, uh, by looking at the moon. So how did he do it? He used lunar eclipses. We'll see eclipses over and over again in this talk. They're an incredibly useful thing for astronomers. Um, so they knew about um, lunar eclipses. Um, the, the Greeks knew that lunar eclipses only occurred when the moon was opposite the sun, that the moon was in the opposite constellation of the zodiac that the sun was. Um, um, and so they knew, because of this, that the, the reason for lunar eclipses um, were because that uh, the moon was actually falling into the Earth's shadow. Okay, this is what causes a lunar eclipse. But then if you look at a lunar eclipse, uh, you can see the, um, um, the shadow of the Earth falling on the, um, on the moon. And the shadow is always a circular arc. Okay? No matter what position, um, uh, what constellation the moon is in, no matter what uh, part of the uh, eclipse you're in, the shadow of the Earth as seen on the moon is always a circular arc. So that means that every single shadow of the Earth must be a circle. And there's only one shape that does that. It's a sphere. Okay, so this is, an, this is a correct argument. It explains, why the, it explains that the Earth is round. So, you know, for example, it can't just be a flat disk. Okay, if it was a flat disk, then the shadows would be like ellipses. Um, and that's not what you see by looking at the moon. Okay, so this is one of the simplest proofs that the Earth is round. Um, Aristotle also knew, um, so I said they didn't have, have any technology. It's not quite true. Uh, they could travel a little bit. Uh, for example, from Greece, uh, they were able to travel to Egypt. Uh, and even uh, um, from Egypt, um, it was enough of a distance that you could start seeing some constellations from the southern hemisphere that you could not see in Greece. That the constellations were slightly different. And Aristotle realized that the reason for this is because even the, the relatively short distance from um, Egypt to Greece was enough to see some curvature of the Earth, and that changed the constellations that you could see. And so that t told him that the, the Earth was not enormously huge. Even just from the, the trip to Egypt to Greece, you could see some of the curvature of the Earth. So its radius was finite. But unfortunately, this argument um, was also correct, but it didn't really give an accurate measurement of exactly what the radius of, this, of the Earth was. So that had to come a little later, about 100 years later, another Greek, Eratosthenes, did compute the radius of the Earth. Um, and uh, he computed it to be 40,000 stadia. That's a Greek unit. In modern units, that's 6,800 kilometers or 4,200 miles. That's a very good estimate. That's accurate to within 8%. Um, you know, there are astronomers nowadays who would kill for 8% accuracy. <laughs> um, but, you know, and he had very little, he had almost no technology to do this. And he, he got an answer within 8%, which is really quite amazing. Um, and it's an indirect argument, as before. Um, so, uh, and, and now it was, it, was, it was done by looking at the sun. Well, not directly at the sun, that's stupid. But, uh, okay, but <laughs> indirectly at the sun, we'll see. Okay. Um, so how did it work? So you may have heard the story before, but I'll tell it again. So Eratosthenes knew, uh, he read a book um, about, um, or maybe a scroll, about um, a well in Syene. Syene is a town in Egypt, a village in Egypt, which had a well. And this well had the funny property that on the summer solstice, June 21st, the longest day of the year, you could look into this well and you could see the sun reflected directly overhead uh, in the water below, even though the well was very deep. 
Okay, and most woes don't do that, but the woe in Sayin did. Okay, and uh, the reason for that, ultimately, we now know, is because Sayin is, is, uh, just has the fortune to lie exactly almost on the Tropic of Cancer, which is one of only two places in the world where this happens. The other is the Tropic of Capricorn on the Southern Hemisphere. So, okay, um, Eratosthenes read this, uh, but he didn't live in Sayin. He lived up in Alexandria, which uh, was also in Egypt, but a bit to the north. Um, and so he decided, being a good scientist, to, to try this experiment. He waited until June 21st and looked into a well, and he did not see the sun reflected in the, in the well below. Um, okay, and so the sun was, was not at an angle. So most people at this point would say, well, okay, that book was rubbish, uh, and move on. But uh, Eratosthenes kept going. He said, okay, what must be happening? He knew about Aristotle. Um, the, 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 we, he knew the earth was curved, and so the reason why um, this, the sun was not reflecting down the well where he, where he lived was because of the curvature of the earth. And he happened to bring with him a measuring stick uh, called a nomon, it's kind of like a little portable sundial. Um, and uh, so he measured exactly um, the angle, the deviation to which, um, to which the, uh, the sun was, was falling. And it was not quite vertical, it was about seven degrees in our units off the vertical. Okay? And he also knew how far it was to um, Sayin. So um, there were merchants going up and down the Nile. They had to know how many days it took to get from A to B. They knew how many stadia they would cover in a day. Uh, so Eratosthenes could just ask these merchants. And, and um, um, some legends say he actually paid, paid some graduate students something like just walk. Um, <laughs> but it's, that's, that's, that, that, that's apocryphal, uh, but believable. Um, but anyway, he knew that the distance from Alexandria to Syene was uh, 5,000 stadia. Um, and just those two pieces of data, and just a little bit of mathematics, that's already enough to work out the radius of the Earth. He just had to know a little bit of trigonometry, um, and um, he had this triangle with, uh, with one side of 5,000 stadia, and that's enough to, to work out the radius of the Earth, and that's how he got his 40,000 stadia number. Okay, uh, one thing just to mention, uh, I drew these lines from the sun as parallel lines, so I'm, I'm assuming the sun is really, really far away. Now that has to be justified, we will see a justification of that a little bit later. Okay, so that's the, that's the first rung, the Earth. We will now go on to the next rung, which is the Moon. So the basic questions here are, what shape is the Moon? Now, this is not a silly question, I'll explain why. Uh, how large is it, um, and how far away is it? These are the basic questions. Okay, so the ancient Greeks also had good answers to, to these questions too. Again, with no technology, just geometry really, and some observation. So, um, first of all, the shape of the Moon. So the Moon looks round, but it could be round and flat, you know. Um, it could be like painted on the sky, you know, for all we know. Um, okay, we know now it's a sphere. Why is it a sphere? Well, you can, um, Aristotle realized it was a sphere uh, just from the, the, the familiar phases of the moon. Crescent moon, half moon, gibbous moon. These phases are caused by the sun lighting up one side of the, um, of, of the, um, of the moon and the other side being, being dark. And he looked at the terminator, the difference between the, the, the edge between the um, light and dark parts of the moon. And this was always an elliptical arc, okay? or maybe a straight line in the case of a half moon. It was, but it was always an ellipse. And again, the only shape with that property is, is, is a sphere. If you have a sphere, then one hemisphere is lit up. And from our perspective, the, um, the, the great circle, or great semicircle, uh, that is the terminator, comes across as an ellipse. If the, Earth was, if the moon was flat, then, in fact, there would be no phases at all. Um, there would just, the moon would, would just be um, bright or dim, but there would be no, no terminator. The terminator comes because of the spherical nature of the moon, not the, not the flat nature of the moon. Um, and around the same time, um, Aristarchus, another Greek, uh, was the first to compute the distance to the moon um, in terms of the Earth's radius, so an indirect measurement. He couldn't measure the distance to the moon directly, but he could measure it in terms of the radius of the Earth, and he said that it was about 60 Earth radii. And this was, again, an amazingly accurate um, answer. In fact, it's basically uh, spot on. Um, the moon actually is, has a slightly elliptical orbit. It varies between 57 and 63 Earth radii, but on the average, uh, Aristarchus was exactly correct. Um, he also computed the radius of the moon. He said that the moon was about one-third the, the radius of the Earth, which is pretty close, 0.33. It's actually 0.27, but um, still not, not bad. Not bad accuracy for, for Greek technology. 
Uh, and of course, we, we know the radius of the Earth. Uh, we, we computed it um, in the first rung, so you just put that, you just combine that with the information, information I just told you, and that gives you the radius of the Moon and, and the distance to the Moon. Okay. So how did Aristarchus do it? So it, it is, an, again, an indirect argument. To find the distance to the Moon, we will use the Sun. And once again, we will use eclipses, lunar eclipses first. So um, lunar eclipses, as I told you already, are caused by the, the Moon passing through the Earth's shadow. Now, how big is the Earth's shadow? Well, the Earth is, is two Earth radii in diameter, and that's basically how wide the Earth's shadow is as well, assuming the Sun is far away, but we'll, we'll get to that in, in a bit. Okay, but the, uh, yeah, the Earth's shadow is about two uh, Earth radii wide. And lunar eclipses, well, the Greeks already observed many, many lunar eclipses. They knew that um, the longest that a lunar eclipse ever lasted was three hours. No eclipse lasted more than three hours. This was the maximum. So that means that it took three hours for the moon to, uh, to cross two Earth radii. On the other hand, uh, it takes, strangely enough, one month, uh, one lunar month, uh, uh, 28 days, for the moon to go around the Earth. You can see that from the moon phases. So it takes, um, it takes 28 days to traverse an entire circumference of the moon's orbit, and it takes three hours to traverse two Earth radii, and that's a simple high school math uh, word problem. You can, that's enough information to work out the distance to the moon in terms of the radius of the, radius of the moon, 60 Earth radii. So that's the distance to the moon. What about the size of the moon? So um, you can look, uh, there are many ways to do it, but one way is just to, to wait until the moon sets. And the moon takes about two minutes to set. You can time it. Um, and so um, from our point of view, the apparent motion of the moon covers two moon radii in two minutes. On the other hand, the moon goes around, um, it makes a full rotation, um, at least apparently to us, once a day. Or not quite once a day, but pretty close to once, once a day. It takes 24 hours to go to complete an entire um, orbit of, of the moon from our, from our perspective, and it takes uh, two minutes to do two moon radii. And again, this is enough information to compute the radius of the moon in terms of the distance to the moon, which you have just computed in terms of the Earth radius. And you put that together, you get that the moon radius is one third of the Earth radius. By the way, just to, to emphasize how little technology they had, um, they didn't, um, so not only did they not have much technology, they did not even have a value of pi at this point. Pi, the first person to get an accurate value of pi was Archimedes. This was, was a, a couple of decades after Aristarchus. Uh, so he had to use triangles instead and some, some, some other trigonometry. Um, so just to emphasize that they had basically zero technology at this point, but they could still get good answers. Okay, so this, that's the Earth and the Moon. The next stop is the Sun. And so the type of questions we care about here are how large is the Sun and how far away is the Sun? And it's still quite amazing. The Greeks could still answer these questions. Uh, although this time, the accuracy began to get a little bit uh, uh, degraded because here they were really bumping up against the limits of the technology. So again, it's an indirect argument. To work out uh, the distance of the Sun, you need to look at the Moon. So um, this is done by Aristarchus. So he already, Aristarchus, as we already saw, computed the radius of the Moon and the distance to the Moon. And the radius of the Moon uh, turned out to be actually 1 1 80th of the distance to the Moon. Distance to the Moon is 60 Earth radii. Radius of the Moon is 1 3rd of an Earth radius. So the, the Moon radius is 1 80th of the distance to the Moon. On the other hand, uh, during a solar eclipse now, um, we have this lucky coincidence that the Moon covers the Sun almost, uh, with almost a perfect fit. It's an, an amazing coincidence. Um, Okay, but, but the, basically the angle of width of the Moon and the angle of width of the Sun are exactly the same, almost. Um, and so you can just use similar triangles, to what you learn in high school, and therefore the radius of the Sun must also be 1 80th of the, radius, of the distance to the Sun, just by similar triangles. Okay, so that tells you that if you know one of these numbers, like if you know the distance to the Sun, that tells you the radius of the Sun, but you still need to work out the distance to the Sun. But he did, did that too. And so once again, you have to use an indirect argument. You again use the moon. So um, we saw that the moon has phases. Um, so for instance, the, um, the moon can be a new moon. And this happens when the moon is between the Earth and the sun. Then we see a new moon. Um, and conversely, uh, if the moon is opposite 
the sun, uh, we see a full moon. Unless it's exactly opposite, then you get an eclipse. But if it's almost opposite, you get a full moon. And then you have half moons, where you see half of the moon. So you, you might think that half moons occur exactly halfway between full moons and new moons. But they don't quite. If you do the trigonometry, half moons actually occur when the moon makes, uh, um, when the Earth and the Sun make a right angle uh, when viewed from the moon, as drawn over there. That, um, that when, um, uh, when you have that right angle, then exactly half of the moon is visible from the Earth. Okay? So half moons do not occur exactly halfway between new moons and full moons. They occur just a little bit closer to a new moon than they do to a full moon. There is, there is some angle which is a little bit less than a right angle. Uh, you can't really see it here, but uh, there's an, there's a, uh, the angle here is slightly less than a right angle. And if you knew that angle, then you can use trigonometry, and you can start working out the distance to the sun. So Aristarchus tried to compute this. He thought that half moons occurred about 12 hours before the midpoint of a new moon and a full moon, that they were 12 hours closer to a new moon than the halfway mark. Um, and of course, they take a whole month to go around um, the Earth. And if you just do some trigonometry, then um, he was able to conclude that the distance to the sun was about 20 times the distance to the moon. Now, the math was correct, um, but his observation was wrong. He, he thought that the um, um, half moon came 12 hours earlier um, than the midpoint. Um, but he was using ancient Greek, Greek technology. First of all, he had no telescopes. So it was hard to, to time exactly when the half moon occurred. Um, secondly, he had no good clocks. Uh, the best clocks in Greek, in Greek times were sundials, and they didn't work well at night. Um, <laughs> so. So, so it, 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 it was difficult. Um, so his answer was actually off by a fair bit. Um, the, tr the true time discrepancy was not 12 hours, as he had thought, but actually only half an hour. Um, and so the distance to the sun is not 20 times uh, as the distance to the moon. It's actually 390 times uh, the distance to the moon. So the math was correct, but because of the limitations of his technology, the, um, the answers he got were inaccurate. But nevertheless, the basic method was correct. And even with the inaccurate data, the uh, inaccurate conclusion that he had, Aristarchus' computations led him to, for the first time, to a very important conclusion in science. That um, he put all the data together, you get that the sun is much larger than the Earth. Um, so, in fact, his computations um, said it was seven times larger. So you think this is obvious nowadays, but it is not obvious. It was not obvious back then. You know, you look at the sun; don't about this big. Okay, the Earth is, is this big. Okay. It is not obvious that the sun is much bigger than the Earth. Now, Aristarchus' computations were wrong. He thought it was, the sun was seven times as big as the Earth. It is actually 109 times as big as the Earth. But the, but the basic um, fact is still the, um, that the sun is much bigger than the Earth. And because of that, um, he was the first to realize that the reigning theory of the time about the solar system, which was that the sun went around the Earth, the geocentric model, was really absurd, because the sun is much bigger than the Earth. Um, and so he was the first to propose the heliocentric model that in fact instead that the Earth went around the Sun. Now you may think, that's not what I learned in school. I thought that, that Copernicus uh, did that 1,700 years later. And he did. Uh, but if you read the first page of the dedication of Copernicus' book, he will, he will say that the, the heliocentric theory was first proposed by Aristarchus. Um, now, there's a reason why, I was, there's, there's an ironic reason actually why, at the time, Aristarchus' theory was not accepted by the other ancient Greeks. And I will tell you why, but not right now. Okay, <laughs> tease you a little bit. Okay, so, but anyway, um, in principle at least, Aristarchus' method gives you the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Now, this is a very important unit, it's called the astronomical unit, and it, it is used for the next three or four rungs of the ladder. Uh, lots and lots of, of other measurements were made in terms of the astronomical unit. Um, so it is incredibly important. Um, as I said, Aristarchus' as, um, estimate was not very accurate, but I'll show you later on there are much better ways to, to measure it nowadays than, uh, than in Aristarchus' time. Okay, so that's the Sun. The next one is the planets. Okay, we now, uh, you know, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, not Pluto. Um, okay, so what do the planets do? So, um, in ancient times, uh, you know, they had astrology, just like they do now. Um, and astrologers are good for some things. Uh, they did figure out that the planets did um, 
um, lie, they, they, they kept moving around. Planet, the, the, the word planet means wandering star. Uh, but they only moved through the zodiac, this, this, this ring of 12 constellations around, uh, around the Earth, you know, Cancer, Libra, and so forth. And so this already tells you that they, all the planets lie on a plane. The plane is called the ecliptic. So it, whatever the motion of the, the planets are, it's a two-dimensional problem, not a three-dimensional one. But they didn't know what the orbit was. Uh, in fact, it looked very funny. You, you look at one planet, say Mars, and sometimes Mars will go west, and then sometimes it will go east. Um, it, it, it just jumps back and forth, and it's very weird. Um, and so, uh, to begin with, it was um, not easy to answer basic questions like how far away is, say, Mars? What orbit does Mars, uh, how does Mars move? And how long does it, does it take to go around one orbit? So, um, the Greeks tried to, to answer these questions too. Uh, and Ptolemy, for example, was the first to make a really good effort. But um, here, remember, they had, they had discounted Aristarchus' model. And they were working with, with the geocentric model. And as a, as a consequence, unfortunately, Despite his best efforts, Tom Lee got basically absolute rubbish as his answers. Um, is it, I, I'm not even citing him here because they're so inaccurate. Um, okay, because he was working with the wrong model. So the first person to get good, good measurements of distances to planets was Copernicus. Okay, now this is what he's known for. This is why he's in the textbooks. Um, and so Copernicus, um, he started out by looking at the records of the ancient Babylonians, actually. So even before the Greeks, the Babylonians watched the stars and the planets. They knew about the planets. They made records. The Babylonians passed them on to the Greeks. The Greeks passed them on to the Arabs. The Arabs passed them on to the, to the Europeans. Uh, so Copernicus knew, had these records. Um, and he knew, for example, that Mars, uh, at least um, uh, from the point of view of the Earth, it, it went in a funny orbit, but it would... Uh, but every 780 days, it would come back to the same constellation that it started with. That it had a period, what's called the apparent period or synodic period, of 780 days. Now, working with the heliocentric model, he knew that this was not the actual period of Mars. Uh, because not only was Mars going around the sun, but Earth was going around the sun as well. It was only, um, it was not, so the, the actual angle of, angle of velocity of Mars was not 1 per 780 days. Only the difference between the angle of velocity of Mars and the angle of velocity of Earth was 1 of 170. On the other hand, he knew that the Earth took one year, strangely enough, to go around the Sun, uh, one solar year, um, 365 days. And then again, a little high school um, math problem, you just add together or subtract these, uh, these angular velocities, and you soon find out that Mars, therefore, the true angular um, velocity of Mars is 687 days. It takes 687 days for Mars, Mars to complete one full orbit around the Sun. And you can do the same for all the other planets. Now, once you have this, um, he also knew at various times, he knew at various times um, what constellation the Sun was in, what constellation Mars was in. Um, that gave him some angle measurements. If you have some angle measurements and then you, you just keep waiting a few days to move the planets around a little bit, you can do some trigonometry. And he was good enough in math that he could, uh, he could do the math and take some more measurements and he could actually work out, uh, assuming all the orbits were circular, he could um, work out the, the, the radius of all of these orbits in terms of the radius of the Earth. So, for instance, he, he computed that the, the uh, radius of, of, the, of Mars's orbit is about 1.5 astronomical units. Mars is 50% further away from the Sun than the Earth. And these are really good answers. They are accurate about two decimal places, 1% right? accuracy. Okay, but not perfectly accurate. Um, a little later on, a couple of centuries later, uh, Tycho Brahe, um, for some reason, actually decided to make some really, really detailed measurements. He was actually quite obsessed with, with, uh, with the planets. And he, made, um, he managed to convince, I think, a prince in Denmark to give him a, an island and some peasants to build him an observatory. And he sat there for 10 years uh, measuring the locations of all the planets. Um, and then, um, but they didn't quite fit the Copernican model. If you actually try to plug in Copernicus um, models of the, the circular um, numbers, circular uh, orbits, um, the data that Tycho uh, Brahe got, the declinations of all the planets, here, for example, are the declinations of Mars, didn't quite fit the Copernican model. And this was picked up by Kepler a little bit later. Uh, Kepler actually had his own theory of the solar system. He thought that it was built up using, uh, actually, uh, platonic solids, of all things. And he needed to, he wanted to, uh, to publish this. He wanted some data to, to back this up. And so he he actually stole Tycho Brahe's data. There's a story behind that. Um, but then he found that the, that the data didn't fit. Um, it didn't fit his theory. It didn't fit the Copernican theory. 
And finally, he was forced to concede that what was going on was that the orbits of Earth and Mars were not actually perfect circles, which is what Copernicus had assumed, that there was something else. So his job now was to take the data he had and work out what was the orbit of Mars and what was the orbit of the Earth. Okay? Um, but how are you going to work out this data? You know, um, if you learn some math, one of the things you learn when you solve equations is that you need at least as many unknowns, uh, at least as many uh, equations as unknowns. You only have one piece of data, and there are two unknowns here, the orbit of Earth and the orbit of Mars. Actually, it's even worse than this, um, because uh, Tycho's data only gives you the direction. Uh, like, at any given time, it tells you where Mars, uh, the direction of where Mars is, the declination, but it does not tell you the distance. Okay, if you know polar coordinates, you know that you need two numbers to determine in, uh, a location in the plane, a declination and distance. Uh, there was no way to measure distance, only declination. So he actually only had half a piece of data and he had to solve for two unknowns. So, so, it, so it looks like there's insufficient information to solve the problem. Um, but nevertheless, Kepler did it. He found an ingenious way to solve the problem. Um, so he had two great ideas. Um, the first idea was that if you wanted to compute the orbit of Mars um, precisely, you must first work out the orbit of the Earth, okay? Because if, if you don't know what the Earth is doing and, and you're sitting on the Earth watching all the other planets, you, there's, there's no chance to work out what the other planets are doing either. So how do you work out the orbit of the Earth? This was his next genius idea. He would use Mars. Okay? So how did this work? So to explain how this works, let me take a, a simpler case. So, of course, Earth and Mars both move. But suppose for simplicity that Mars did not move, that Mars was fixed. It was nailed to space somehow. Okay, it just sat over there in the corner. Okay, and, and only the Earth moves. Okay, and, but we don't know how. The Earth is doing something. But no matter where you are, uh, no matter when you are, the Earth is somewhere, and you can, you can see Mars, and you can see the Sun, and you can see um, what direction, what constellation the Sun is in, and you can see what constellation um, Mars is in. And so you have these two directions. And on the other hand, you have this fixed axis. The, uh, the axis between Earth and Mars, so the Sun and Mars, is fixed. Okay? I mean, we're assuming Mars does not move. So we have this fixed side and two angles. And if you know some high school geometry, the angle side angle theorem, that if you know a side and two angles of a triangle, that tells you the triangle. That tells you where you are. This is um, a very ancient technique. It's called triangulation. Ancient navigators, if they wanted to know where on the ocean they were, if they could see two landmarks that they recognized, and they, they can measure their directions, that's enough to tell them where they are. This is triangulation. Um, you may think it's so archaic, we don't use it nowadays, but I bet many of you use it to come here. GPS works by triangulation, uh, or tetrangulation. You use four satellites, um, but it's the same principle. Okay. Now, so if Mars was fixed, then you can work out the orbit of the Earth. But Mars is not fixed. Mars moves as well. And so you are not triangulating with respect to a fixed axis. You're tri triangulating with respect to an axis that keeps moving in a way that you don't understand. All right? The orbit of Mars is unknown. So it appears that triangulation does not work. But Kepler did not give up at this point. He had one additional piece of information, okay, something he knew from Copernicus. Every 687 days, Mars comes back to where it was before. So, if you don't take all the data, but if you just take Brahe's data in intervals of 687 days, in that interval, Mars is fixed. And for that interval, you can triangulate. And there's barely enough data um, in, in Brahe's data that you can do this. Um, you know, this, there was a, it was a good reason why he, uh, good, uh, it was good that he sat there for 10 years doing this. Um, <laughs> so, you take, you take this interval of, of, six, of, of 687 um, day data, and this is enough to, to give you the orbit of the Earth relative to one fixed point on Mars's orbit. And so that tells you Mars's orbit, that tells you the Earth's orbit relative to one fixed point on Mars. So once you have that, once you have Earth's orbit, now that you can use as a fixed reference. And then you take another interval of 687 day data, and then you can figure out another point on Earth's or Mars's orbit relative to the Earth's orbit that you've already computed. And you just keep doing this, and this will give you back Mars's orbit. Okay. So this was Kepler's idea. Um, Einstein, oh, of course our sponsor in some sense, uh, who wrote, uh, once wrote a preface to a book on astronomy, which, uh, a book on, on Kepler actually, and um, he, he mentioned this idea of Kepler, he called it an idea of pure genius. 
And you know, if Einstein calls you work genius, you're really doing well. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so Kepler worked out, um, you know, he worked out all the orbits. Of course, you know, nowadays we don't have to do all this because we have Kepler's laws, right, which have given all these answers for us. So he didn't have them back then. But because he had worked out painstakingly the orbits of Mars and Saturn and so forth, he, he worked out all these orbits and he formulated the three laws of planetary motion, Kepler's laws. Um, and this was very important in, in physics. It led later on, a, a century or two later, Newton to then um, deduce uh, from Kepler's laws, actually, his own law, the law of universal gravitation, um, his, this, his famous inverse square law for gravity. Okay, so um, Kepler's methods, um, one thing they did was that they, they gave all the distances to all the other planets in terms of the astronomical unit, the distance to the Earth, um, and very precisely. Um, okay, I mean, they're ellipses, so they, they, they wobble back and forth, but you can measure exactly how much they wobble. Um, so one thing this does for you is that it actually gives you a new way to measure the astronomical unit. That if you can measure, say, the distance to, say, Venus, um, and because you, can, you, you then combine that with Kepler's measurements, and that will give you back the astronomical unit. And so um, the first really accurate measures of the astro astronomical unit were done using Kepler's methods combined with measurements of things like the distance to Venus. And one way to do, do this is by parallax. Um, if, if you're able to have uh, on two different, two different ends of the Earth, in the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere, if you, at the same time, you observe the same planet and you measure the angle um, that you see from, from one um, location and the angle from the other location, and, you take the, and you, it's so accurate that you can look at the difference, you get the angle, we already know the radius of the Earth. So just by trigonometry, once you have that angle, and the radius of the Earth, that tells you the, the distance to, say, Venus. And then, using Kepler, that will give you the distance, uh, say, to the Sun. Okay? So, um, you could do this. But it's tricky. You need, first of all, you need to travel to the other side of the planet. Uh, you need uh, accurate clocks. You need good telescopes. You need good sextants. Okay? Copernicus did not have this. Kepler did not have this. But by the 18th century, the Europeans had this. And uh, the first person to actually do all this and get a really good accurate measurement of the astronomical unit uh, was James Cook. Uh, who, well, he did one of the two measurements. Um, you know, so someone had to go to the southern hemisphere and measure the other measurement, and uh, James Cook did this. Um, James Cook voyage is famous, especially in my home country of Australia, um, but uh, he was there really for a scientific mission. That was, that was uh, his, the purpose of his voyage, um, in part to do things like this. Okay? Discovering Australia was actually just a bonus. Okay. Uh, nowadays, actually, we have much, even more precise ways to compute things like the astro astronomical unit because we have things like radar. We just, if you want the distance to the sun, you just bounce a radar wave off of, off of the sun, wait until you come back, multiply the speed of light, which we also know how to compute. Um, and that gives you incredibly precise uh, information on things like the astronomical unit. So uh, we have, uh, everything up, up to this point is now extremely precise. And it's important that we have all these precise measurements because um, doing that, uh, we found that, um, that uh, Kepler's theory, Kepler's laws were not quite correct. That if you look at the orbit of Mercury in particular, Kepler says that Mercury must move in an ellipse. And it doesn't quite, it wobbles a little bit. The, the ellipse wobbles every time it goes around. And Newton's law of gravity did not quite explain this. And, uh, and it's, it, this was an important observation. It was one of the first major confirmations of Einstein, again our sponsor, um, his, uh, his theory of general relativity. Um, the precession of Mercury was explained by this theory. It was one of the, the first famous uh, applications of uh, his theory. And we'll need um, general relativity uh, later on in this ladder. In fact, we will always see that um, astronomy has helped the development of physics, and conversely, physics has helped the development of astronomy. The two go hand in hand. Okay, so the next rung uh, is, uh, I'll talk about the speed of light. Now, I needed a picture to depict the speed of light. This is the best picture I could come up with. Um, <laughs> Actually, uh, um, the, 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 uh, the UCLA math department actually managed to get permission from Lucasfilm so that you can see this image today. Okay, so thank you to the uh, math department for that. Um, now, this is not a distance, so it doesn't, strictly speaking, belong on the distance ladder. But, um, well, you'll see why I put it in here. It, it, but it, it's important to know in order to get to later parts of the ladder. Okay, um, so the speed of light is tricky to measure. Um, for a long time, there was even an argument whether light was, had traveled at finite speed or infinite speed. It was not known. Um, Galileo, back in the 17th century, uh, tried to do this. He's, he got a friend and said, okay, I'm going I'm to get up on one hill with a lantern, and you're going to get up on the other hill. 
I'm going to unshutter my lantern, and when you see that light, you unshutter your lantern, and I'll, I'll time how long it takes to come back. And from this, I'll try to work out the speed of light. <laughs> so uh, Galileo reported that this, this experiment did not work. Um, <laughs> but the, the method was correct. It's uh, the mathematics, it's just the, the, the technology. Um, nowadays, we can actually make that experiment work with, with, with nanosecond clocks and so forth. We can actually do something like Galileo's experiment on a tabletop in the lab with, with uh, you know, lasers and, and, and LCD displays and so forth, and, and we can actually do this. Uh, um, but uh, the first accurate measurement um, of the speed of light was done in the 17th century. Um, it actually used the same idea, but um, two different hilltops were not far enough apart to make the argument work. So they used two planets instead. So, um, and in particular, they used Jupiter and a moon of Jupiter, uh, uh, Io, in fact. So Io is one of the four big moons of Jupiter and is the closest moon of Jupiter to uh, the planet itself. So close that it orbits incredibly quickly. It, uh, Io goes around Jupiter once every 42 and a half hours, two days. You know, the moon, our moon, takes 28 days to go around. It's, a, it's, a, it's slow. Io goes only two days to go around Jupiter, which is actually a much bigger planet. So Io scoots around um, Jupiter, and you can see it in telescopes. It's this little dot around Jupiter. It goes left and right, and it falls into Jupiter. It goes in and out of Jupiter's shadow. So, it, 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 so again, there's uh, these eclipses again. And you can, see, you can see Io disappear and reappear, disappear, reappear. And so Roma just um, made many, many measurements for, for over a year of Io going in and out, in and out, just timing when um, uh, when I entered in and out, and it was very regular. It said, you know, every 42 and a half hours, I would go in and out, in and out. But not quite. If he did this over a year, over, uh, he discovered that um, half the time the orbit came ahead of schedule, and half the time it became uh, behind schedule. That when Jupiter was on the same side as the Earth, um, the orbit was a little bit ahead of schedule. Uh, it came earlier than, than anticipated. Um, and when Jupiter was on the opposite side of the Sun, uh, the orbit came to his telescope a little bit um, behind schedule. Not by much, you know, um, but, uh, by, but the, the lag was about 20 minutes. Okay, but by that point, the clocks were good enough that you could actually measure a 20 minute difference over a period of a year. So Huygens uh, uh, and Roma figured, this, figured out what was going on. Uh, the reason why there was this lag was that when the Earth was on the opposite side of the sun of, of, to Jupiter, the light from Jupiter and Io had to travel longer to get to the Earth. How much longer? Two astronomical units. Okay, so it takes 20 minutes for light to travel two astronomical units, and that's enough information to work out the speed of light. And so they got a, they got the first reasonable measurement of the speed of light as about uh, 220,000 kilometers a second. Not completely accurate. The actual truth is more like 300,000. But um, considering the technology they had, this is an amazingly good estimate. And shortly afterwards, with these um, uh, observations, further observations of uh, the astronomical unit, they got much better um, um, measurements of C pretty, pretty, pretty shortly. So this was a very important number to get, the speed of light. Um, for instance, um, it led James Cook Maxwell at, uh, shortly afterwards. He was uh, working out his laws of electromagnetism. So he had unified electricity and magnetism into his four equations of electromagnetism that you learn, in, uh, uh, you learn here in your physics classes. Um, and um, and one of the consequences of his theory was that, was that there were these electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic radiation, and they traveled at a certain speed, given by uh, the permittivity and permeability of free space. And so he computed this speed, how fast does electromagnetic radiation travel? And he got a number. And he looked at the numbers, and that looked familiar. And so he looked up um, the speed of light, the best estimate of the speed of light at the time, and it was almost the same number. And so he was the first to realize um, that light is a form of electromagnetic radiation. It is the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this was a very important advance in science. Um, among other things, it led to Einstein's theory of special relativity. Um, he famously worked this out by, by asking what would happen if I ride on, on a beam of light. Um, it also led to the development of spectroscopy, uh, the ability to determine very precisely the color of, of, of various things, like atoms or stars. And this will Okay, and both of these we need to keep going up the ladder. Okay, so we've done uh, sun, moon, planets. Uh, next stop is uh, nearby stars, things like Proxima Centauri. Um, so, okay, we've already seen parallax. Um, if, you, if you make a, a measurement of the same 
um, object at two different places on the Earth, you can use that to work out distance, just like your two eyes can work out distance to objects. Um, but there's a limit to how much, how, to, to how, how well our distance vision works, and there's also a limit as to how well this parallax method works. Um, it does not, if, you, if, you, uh, if you do James Cook's method to try parallax to the, um, the, uh, the stars, even the newest star, Proxima Centauri, um, it's so far away, uh, it's, um, it's about uh, 270,000 uh, astronomical units away. So it's 200,000 times further away than the sun. Um, and there's just not enough parallax uh, to make two different measurements on the Earth and see um, this distance. In fact, the parallax is, is only about um, one ten thousandth of an arc second. An arc second is one sixtieth of an arc minute. An arc minute is one sixtieth of a degree. A degree is one thirty sixtieth of, of a full rotation. It's incredibly tiny. Even our best telescopes cannot do this right now. But you don't have to um, just do two, um, um, two Earth radii worth of parallax. If you just make a measurement and then you just sit on the Earth for six months, the sun will move you conveniently two astronomical units over this way. And that gives you a lot more parallax. Um, and then so that is enough to start seeing um, some deviation in, in stars. Like if you take a photograph of one portion of, 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 um, of, of, of the night sky, um, and then you wait six months and you take the same photograph, most of the stars that are far away stay where they are, but a few stars, the nearby stars, will shift. And so there is enough parallax. Once you have some good telescopes, you can see this. And if you know the astronomical unit, you can start computing distances to nearby stars. And all stars that are reasonably nearby, about 100 light years, within 100 light years, or about 30 parsecs. A parsec is exactly how much distance gives you a parallax of one arc second. Um, that is about the limit of what we can do with actual telescopes uh, to measure all distances of stars nearby. And that's fortunate because that gives you a lot of stars. About 10,000 stars are close enough that we can actually complete the distances. And this is very important to have all this data because we need this data to climb the next rung. Um, this is, a, this is a, a very common thing in this business. In order to keep going up, we must keep collecting lots and lots of data. I mean, you've already seen some heroic efforts to collect data. We'll see more. Okay, uh, now I'll get back to something I said before. You remember I talked about Aristarchus' heliocentric theory. Whoops, not yet. Um, yeah, so the, these parallax things were first done by Bessel uh, in the 19th century. I think now, okay. Yeah, so um, when Aristarchus just... Um, I proposed a heliocentric model. The, his, the other ancient Greeks dismissed it because they said that this, this theory cannot possibly work because if the Earth moved around the sun, then we would see parallax. The, 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 the stars in the night sky would be different in a different position in June as they would in January. And we don't see that. At least they didn't with their, with their technology, no telescopes. And so the, the reason that there's no way that the heliocentric theory could work unless the stars were this ridiculous distance away, which of course can't be true, um, because if, if they were that far away, we, we wouldn't see them unless they were incredibly bright and big, like as big as the sun. And, you know, that's, that's just ridiculous. So, it's a shame, actually, because, I mean, the, the Greeks did amazing things. They, they had all this logic and mathematics, and they did so many wonderful things, but sometimes they still made mistakes, um, which, which is a real shame, because they, they could have hit upon the truth much earlier, but, um, but they didn't. Okay. Um, because they didn't, I mean, it was just inconceivable, you know, that the stars are that, that far away, but they are. Okay, so that's nearby stars, but nearby stars are only a very, very small portion of the Milky Way, uh, of our own galaxy. So, you know, in this picture, maybe just a little, a, a little circle like that, that's, 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 about, um, one, that's about how much one, uh, 100 light years out, just a tiny, tiny portion of the Milky Way. Parallax does not work for the rest of the galaxy. But you can use all this data about nearby stars and extrapolate it to work out distances to, to, to distant stars. And the way you do this is a very ingenious method. Um, now that you have all these um, tools like spectroscopy, you can look at a star, near or far, and you can work out its color. Right? Some stars are blue, some stars are red, some stars are yellow, um, in, in the spectral sense. And you can also um, take a, a photograph or use some electronic photo det detector and you can measure how bright a star is. Some stars are brighter than others. Okay? Even the Greeks knew this, um, but we, you can make precise measurements. But that's only the apparent brightness. That's how, much the star, how bright the star looks to us. Now, a star could be bright either because it really is very, very bright or because it's very close. Okay? It could be a dim star very close and it looks bright. Um, like the sun, for example, is not, is not one of the brightest stars out there, but it's definitely much brighter than the other stars we see. 
because it's much closer. But if you have a nearby star, we already know its distance. Okay? You know how far away these stars are, you know the apparent brightness, and then you can just use the inverse square law, um, and that tells you the absolute brightness. You know how bright all the, for all the nearby stars out there, you can use the distance measurements and the apparent brightness measurements, and that tells you the exact uh, absolute brightness, how bright these, all these nearby stars actually are. So, you have these 10,000 stars, you know how bright they are, and you know their color. And so, two astronomers, Hertzsprung and Russell, uh, plotted thousands of stars, all the stars that they could find nearby, he plotted their brightness and their color uh, about 100 years ago. And they got this diagram, which we now call the hertzsprung russell diagram. So they, they found that there was a relationship between color and um, color, which is the, sorry, the x-axis, and magnitude, which is the, the y-axis, that uh, red stars are, are, are less bright, blue and white stars are more bright. The sun is somewhere in the middle. Um, and so we have this, this relationship between color and brightness. And every time you have a relationship like this, some sort of curve, this is, this is great for astronomy. You can use this curve to do things. In fact, you can reverse this curve, and now we can measure distances to other stars, stars very far away, uh, much further than parallax can reach. And the way you do that is that if you have a star that's really far away, uh, you can again use spectroscopy, you find out the color of the star, use photography, and you can find the, the apparent brightness of the star. Okay, these things you, you can always do, uh, as, as long as the star is not too, too far away. Um, and then we can use the hertzsprung russell diagram, it gives a relationship between color and absolute brightness. And once you have absolute brightness and apparent brightness, you use the inverse square law, and that gives you distance. Okay, so you just combine all these measurements together, and you can get the distance to stars that are quite far away. And this works quite well. You, it's called main sequence fitting. And now it's, um, it works up to stars that are even like 300,000 light years away. So, so not 100 light years, but 300,000 light years away. Much, much further. Um, and in, in particular, enough to cover the, uh, the Milky Way, which is only about 100,000 light years in diameter. So using main sequence fitting, you can work out um, basically distances all throughout the galaxy. Um, beyond that, what happens is that they're too faint. The, galaxy, the stars are too faint to measure them properly. Also, they tend to be too close together to other stars, and so it's hard to work out the brightness of any given star because all the other stars are in the way. Okay, so that's um, the Milky Way, so, but that's only one of billions of galaxies out there. We've got to do the other galaxies too. So this was first done by uh, Henry de Swan Leavitt uh, in the 19, um, um, early 20th century. Um, so she was observing uh, a special type of star, a very bright big star called a Cepheid, because they were first found in the constellation Cepheus. Um, these stars are, are very big and unstable. They, they wobble. They, they become very bright and then dim, and bright and dim. They oscillate in a very periodic way. Like maybe every 14 days, for example, they might oscillate in brightness. And so um, some of them were in our galaxy and some were in distant galaxies. The ones in our galaxy, she was able to work out the distance to, and she could work out their apparent brightness, so she could work out how bright each, um, each one of these Cepheids were if they were in our own galaxy. And she could also work out the period. And so she collected lots and lots of data, and she plotted it. This is actually her original plot from 1912. She plotted um, um, the period and, and, um, and apparent brightness of many, many Cepheids. They become two types, type 1 and type 2 Cepheids. And she got, she got a curve. The bigger, the, the, uh, the bigger and brighter the star, the Cepheid, the longer the period. And so there was this curve. Um, the data does not fit very well here because this is 1912 data. Okay, with, 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 with uh, 21st century data, we have a much better curve right now. Um, but even back then, she could plot this curve. And much like uh, the hertzsprung russell diagram, you can, you can, once you have this curve, you can use it to extract, you can extrapolate it beyond uh, our own galaxy and to, to, to work out distances in other galaxies. And, um, okay, and, and this works because Cepheids are so bright that you can see them even in galaxies that are very, very far away. Um, so, for example, the, um, um, the, the most distant Cepheid that we've ever seen through the Hubble Space Telescope is about 108 million light years away. Okay? You know, in contrast, the Milky Way is only 100,000 light years away. So, 1,000 times further away than the diameter of the Milky Way. We can still see Cepheids. We can still measure distances out to a huge distance. Or it, it, um, it looks huge, but still not so huge compared to the size of the universe. 
Okay, so 100 million light years sounds pretty big until you realize the universe is actually about 76 billion light years wide. So we're still not at the top of the ladder. Okay, but this is another significant rung. Okay, you now get a whole bunch of galaxies that you can measure. And that gives you lots of data for the next rung of the ladder. Okay, so lots of, all the galaxies within about 100 million light years, you can measure distance to by, the, uh, by say, Cepheid measurements. Um, it's not just Cepheids that we use. That's one of the, the, that's the oldest way of measuring distance to galaxies. We now have many other ways of doing it too. Uh, you can also use supernovas. There's certain properties of supernovas that you can use to measure distances. But you have to be very lucky because supernovas don't happen very often. And you just have to wait and get lucky. But if a supernova happens in a galaxy, then you can use it to work out uh, how far away that galaxy is. Um, and that works really quite well. Um, supernovas are one of the brightest objects we can, in the universe uh, when they happen. And so we can see them out to really far distances. The, um, the most distant supernova we've ever seen is about 11 billion light years away. That's getting close, actually, to the limit of the observable universe. Uh, it's unlikely we can see much further than that. Um, so you can, sometimes you can see a lot further. And you can use these, these, these alternate ways to measure distances to calibrate and confirm uh, the Cepheid uh, measurements, too. OK, so this gives you a huge chunk of the universe, but not the whole thing. OK, so finally, the top rung, at least we think it's the top rung, is the, is the whole universe. OK. So um, the way we measure distances throughout the rest of the universe uh, is, uh, well, we, we do it thanks to this great observation of Hubble. So Hubble did the same thing that Hertzsprung and Russell and Levitt did before him. Um, he collected lots of data, and he tried to get a curve. Um, so he was measuring all these galaxies. He knew now the distances to many, many galaxies. Uh, but he saw that some galaxies were redder than they should be. That some of the spectral lines were shifted to the red, to the red from what theory predicted. And so there was this red shift for, for certain galaxies. And he found that the further away the galaxy was, the redder, um, the redder it was. And relativity to, told him that the reason why you're red, you're red shifted is because these galaxies are, are moving further away from you. Or well, actually, more precisely, because the, the, uh, the space between uh, the galaxies is expanding, actually, more precisely. Um, but, so, but, but he plotted for you know, hundreds of galaxies how far away they were, the distance, versus how far they were moving away from us. And he got a nice linear law, which is now known as Hubble's law, that the recessional velocity of, of anything, of, of, of any galaxy, is uh, proportional to the distance uh, uh, from the galaxy. Okay. Um, so this was, again, very important for physics. Uh, if the universe was expanding, then you run time backwards. That means the universe was contracting. And so at some point, it must all have been in one location. And this led, it was one of the major confirmations of the Big Bang Theory, which is now, now universally accepted. Um, and confirmed not just by, by these observations, but by many other observations. But this curve, this Hubble's law, gives us yet another way to measure distances. But this time, it works all across the universe. Um, if you have um, any galaxy out there, you can measure its redshift using spectroscopy. You know the speed of light. This will tell you um, how far it's receding from you. And Hubble's law then gives you the distance. And so you can measure any object you can actually see, you can work out its distance using Hubble's law. Not always very accurately, but over time, we have, we have managed to, to refine Hubble's law to the point where it gets fairly accurate. So this is great. I told you before um, that one of the difficulties of astronomy is that you can only measure uh, declinations, uh, directions, but not distances. Um, but once you have distances, um, then you can start making two-dimensional, three-dimensional maps of the universe, because you now have all the polar coordinates you need. So you can now take lots of data, collect data of all the galaxies out there, their, their, measure their, their, their direction and their redshift, which gives you their distance. And that gives you, in polar coordinates, location of all the galaxies out there. And you can start making maps. And so people started doing this. Um, so this is, this is called the two-degree two degree field. It's, it's a two-degree slice of the universe. Um, every dot here is a galaxy. And what people found when they assembled these maps is that the galaxies were not randomly strewn across space. They tended to cluster in these little strands. And we've given them some names. Um, this, big, this big string on the left uh, is called the Great Wall, the Sloan Great Wall. So you've heard of the Great Wall of China. This is a bigger wall. This is the Great Wall of Galaxies. <laughs> much, much bigger. It, it is, in fact, almost the biggest structure known in the universe. Um, yeah, so we've discovered these very, very large-scale structures. 
Um, and all this data has told us a lot about the shape of the universe and the Big Bang, and we, ha we now have a, a fairly convincing model of how the, the universe was created. There's still some parameters we have to, we have to hammer out. But it, it's given us the confidence to, tell, to, to work out a lot about the universe, uh, even beyond that which we can directly see. So um, we can only see the, 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 um, the most distant object we've ever seen, actually, directly seen. Um, is, is about 13 light, billion light years away. There was, a, there was a, a, a gamma ray burst, as it turns out. But um, using the information we have now on the shape of the, shape of the universe, we can extrapolate to, um, to way beyond that. And uh, we now know, for instance, that the universe, um, even the part that we can't currently see, the total extent of the universe must be at least 78 billion light years in diameter. Um, the way we, we, we do this is that we don't look at the universe as, as it is today, because we can't at that distance, but we look at the very distant past, in fact, very near the Big Bang, um, and there's a residue of the Big Bang which is called the cosmic microwave background, and you can use that um, and the models of space-time that we have to get, to get this number. Okay. Um, now, the ancient Greeks were able to do all this using high school trigonometry and no technology. Uh, we need a lot more mathematics and a lot more technology to get these numbers. For each rung of the ladder, you, you, you need much more stuff much more technology, much more physics, much more math, much more statistics, and so forth. So there's, there's, there's lots and lots of math that comes in, high-powered math, general relativity, um, some statistics, some, some regression, some probability, fluid mechanics, nonlinear optics, lots and lots of stuff. Um, but, uh, and um, lots of computations, lots of man hours, lots of computer hours, but we can do it. Uh, we also need cutting-edge technology, uh, lots and lots of telescopes, including, of course, the important space-based telescopes, like Hubble and uh, WMAP, which unfortunately was recently decommissioned uh, about last week, actually. It's finished its mission. Um, I mean, it, 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 it got us, it, it got us uh, this map, um, which was basically its primary mission. Um, it's now in a decaying orbit. But anyway, um, yeah, we, um, we need the latest technology, the latest mathematics, and we're still not done. Uh, we, we don't yet have a complete picture of the universe, and so astronomy is not, not a, by no means a dead subject. People are still very busily um, Fixing, you know, making everything on the, like I said currently more accurate, and then ex extrapolating it to e even further, and that's where we are today. So to close, I wanted to show you four maps, which I think summarize quite quite clearly where we are today. So the map on the top left, this is called Tomley's map. It's a very famous map in cartography. Uh, it was made by Tomley, the same Tomley who tried to work out distances to planets uh, in the first century A.D. Um, and so he lived in Egypt. Um, but, uh, so he didn't, tr he didn't travel to all these other places because he couldn't. But what he could do is that, um, first of all, he bought every map that he could get his hands on. Um, but he could talk to merchants who would come, say, from India by the Silk Road or, or from, from Britain or from North Africa. And he would ask them, okay, how long did it take them to, to you for, uh, uh, for you to get, say, from China to India, from India to, to, to Persia, whatever. And um, from these time measurements, he tried to work out distances and he tried to put this all together as best he could to get a map of the world. And this, this, is, this is what he got. And for first century technology, it's a really good map. You compare it to the actual map of the world. And it, you, know, um, you, know, you try to do better for first century technology uh, with, um, than, than this map here. For a thousand years, this was the best map of the world in existence. It was copied and copied over and over again. Um, but uh, OK, so down here is the two degree field, uh, which we've seen before. This is our Tomley's map. This is our, pretty much still, our best map of the universe we have currently. Um, and actually, it works very much on the same principle as Tomley. You know, we look at every galaxy, we ask how far away it is. And we get, we, we put it together as best we can. And that is, that is our map. And we get these, these strands. Now, on the right here, what this should be, uh, what I should be putting here is the actual map of the universe. But I couldn't find that online. Um, <laughs> so, what I have here instead is a simulation of, of a fake universe in a computer, where uh, it's a bit hard to see with the lights. I don't know if you can dim them a little bit. But, um, but every dot in, 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 this, in this simulation is a single galaxy. And you just evolve it for, for several billion years using gravity to, 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 to move, move the, these around. And you find that gravity organizes these, um, when you run the simulation, over billions of years, the galaxies organize into strands. And the strands look very much like the strands we actually see from, from the distance ladder and all our data and observations. And that's a very good sign. That means that, that's, that's, that's a great confirmation that, that all the computations that I got up to this point are reasonably correct because they're matching the simulations of the models of the universe that we are using. Um, 
Now, um, maybe in the future, in, in, um, you know, in a few more decades, we can actually replace that computer simulation with an actual map of the universe. That would be a fantastic achievement. But that we're not there yet, but, hope, but maybe in, the, in, the, in this century uh, we will see that. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Professor Tao. If anyone would like to ask some questions, you can walk to the front of the aisles here and line up at the microphones. Now, we won't have time for comments, but, if, but just short questions. So if you want to come down to the microphones, we're ready. We'll see who will be first here. Good. We have a little more light there. That's good. Just come right down here. Little boy coming down. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> How long did it take you to get the field badge? The field's medal? The field's medal. Uh, okay. Well, I got it in 2006. Um, so, uh, but uh, I, I wasn't working directly um, for it. Actually, I was very surprised when I got the phone call, actually. Um, I just work on my math, and, and uh, every so often I prove a theorem, and sometimes people notice. Okay, so. okay thank you. Yes, go ahead, sir. That, uh, these maps of the stars, like that one in the lower left, mm -hmm. now that's based on where we see the stars, right? Uh, yes. Have, has there been any attempt to adjust those maps to where they actually are based upon the fact that we see them as they were? Um, um, it's a little hard because we don't know fully the velocities of each of these things. Um, it's, it's, um, we, um, you can do a little bit of this. So, for example, um, I said that the diameter of the universe is about 78 billion light years. Um, and the way this was done was that um, we looked way into the past. This picture here is a picture of space and time. Space is the vertical axis, time is the horizontal axis. Uh, the WMAP probe was able to look way into the past and see the cosmic background radiation from the distant past. And that told the shape of the universe a long time ago. And then they extrapolated that forward to the present day. And that's where they got this, this number 78 billion uh, from that extrapolation. So uh, we do do some of that, but it's, it's hard. Yeah. Yes, go ahead, uh, Thank you. Uh, just as you mentioned in your lecture, uh, Lomer, Lomer discovered that it takes IO two days to, to circle around Jupiter. Yes. Uh, while it's take 28 days for, for Moon to circle around, to circle around our Earth. Yes. But that's, be, that's before the instance uh, relativity. Actually, two days, two days for Jupiter is not actually two days in the Earth. So, so is that correct? That's, that's true. Relativity does give some corrections, uh, to, to, but, but very small corrections. The, the, the gravity field of Jupiter is actually quite weak. Uh, from the standards of relativity. Yeah, and so I, I think it only affects things by a second or two. Um, it, it doesn't really affect, um, I mean, um, and there are many, many other measurement errors made. So I think the, the effect of relativity was actually quite minor. Um, because nowadays when we do compute things like the speed of light, we do definitely take relativity into account. Uh, even our GPS units, um, you know, we can, we can, these GPS units are accurate to within meters, and that's because they adjust for general relativity. Otherwise, they'd be, they'd be like miles off. But uh, um, yeah, we do know how to adjust for that. Um, uh, in, in second, uh, what is your creative and most enjoyable period, period in your life? In Flinders University or in Princeton or in UCLA? Uh, <laughs> feel free if you don't choose the last one. We won't tell the dean. Okay. I am obliged to say that UCLA has been the most productive period of my, of my career. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay. But it's also the truth. Right, so I'm told that the reception is now ready for us outside, so let's give one more thanks to Professor Powell.